A couple of weeks ago, I started with a little quiz about famous TV partners. If you were here, you might remember Fred and Barney, Batman and Robin, Starsky and Hutch, and most of you did quite well on that little quiz. That one was uh, designed to be an introduction to the partnership between the Apostle Paul and Barnabas as they began the great missionary adventure of taking the gospel to the Gentile world in the book of Acts. Now today, I want to do another little quiz, this one about famous breakups, again, from the world of entertainment. I'm going to put the image up, and then I want you to just try to guess who it is and say the names out loud. Okay, ready to go? Let's start with this pair. Sonny and Cher. Okay, bonus question. When did Sonny and Cher break up? Answer is 1975. Double bonus question. Who told Sonny he could actually sing? How about this pair? Anybody know? The Captain and Tennille. Bonus question. What was the captain's real name? Anybody? Go ahead. Daryl Dragon. If you knew that, I think I should pray for you. Double bonus question, the most famous song that Captain and Tennille sang, right, Love Will Keep Us Together. And that was true, at least for a while, but the Captain and Tennille divorced, sadly, after 39 years of marriage. Of course, you recognize these guys, the Beatles. When did the Beatles break up? 1970. That band was together only about 10 years and still rake in millions on royalties today. Last couple I have for you, I'll put them on the screen. That's right, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. Their TV show was called I Love Lucy. How long did it last? 1951 to 1957. And Lucy and Desi were divorced then in 1960 after 20 years of marriage. Today we're continuing our year-long preaching series from the book of Acts. We're in a mini-series right now called The Power of One, reaching together. Let me give you a quick summary of where we've been. We're 15 years or so into the story of the church, and the gospel's exploding all over the ancient world. Saul of Tarsus, now Paul the Apostle, has received a call to take the gospel to the Gentile world. Paul and Barnabas form a partnership that is a team along with a young man named John Mark, and they begin the first missionary journey together. They travel from Syrian Antioch, which is north of Israel, out into the island of Cyprus in the Mediterranean Sea, where Barnabas happened to, to be from, and then they go northward to what we would call Turkey. They preach the gospel together, they face all kinds of opposition together, and then they come home some three years later and they celebrate together with the early believers of the young church. In this series, we've also learned about the Jerusalem Council how the leaders of the church came to a significant decision that the Gentiles did not have to become Jews before they become, could become Christians. That they established that the gospel does not, does not belong to any particular culture or ethnic group. Everyone's now on the same page. There's great unity in the gospel and great unity in the church. But today we look at a story where that unity, that oneness, is severely tested. We're in Acts chapter 15, beginning in verse 36. Let me read these verses to you. And after some days, it's now actually a couple of years after Paul and Barnabas returned from their first journey, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Paul basically is suggesting a second short-term mission trip. His idea is to go back to the towns and, visited, uh, towns and cities they visited on the first journey to just see how those young believers and how those young startup churches are doing. It makes perfect sense. Verse 37, now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought it best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Let me pause there. Remember that when Paul and Barnabas first got together, they took this young man named John Mark with them, who many scholars believe was actually a cousin to Barnabas. John had sailed with them to Cyprus, but when they left Cyprus to go to Perga in southern Turkey, John did not continue the journey with them. Instead, he turned around and went back home. 
We see that part of the story in just one verse back in Acts chapter 13 where we read in Acts 13, 13, Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Now Luke doesn't tell us exactly why John Mark bailed out on that first journey. Scholars have made a number of educated guesses as to what might have been going on. Those guesses include, some say John Mark was too young and just wasn't prepared for the rigors of that kind of pioneering ministry. The travel was difficult, and when Paul decided to take them up northward into the mountainous regions of Turkey, John Mark had had enough. He went home. Some say he might have been homesick. Remember from earlier in Acts, the church gathered in John Mark's mother's home for prayer because she had a home large enough to accommodate them. So it's evident that John Mark was probably from an affluent family, and maybe he struggled being away from them and struggled uh, being away from the safety and comforts of home. He was homesick. Some say he may have objected to Paul assuming leadership of the team. After all, Barnabas was his cousin. Barnabas was the one that convinced the early believers to trust Paul, the man who had one time been their persecutor. And John Mark may have thought Barnabas deserved to lead the team. Still others think John Mark may have objected to Paul's growing focus on preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, to the non-Jewish world. The bottom line is that for any number of reasons, John Mark begins to doubt his role on this team. Or he begins to doubt the direction and the leadership of this team, and he decides to go back home. Verse 39, and there arose a sharp disagreement. The Greek word used here is paroxysmos, from which we get our English word paroxysm. And the best translation might be a passionate or fierce conversation. A sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. It's a short story, but it's an important one. The first thing we see is the inevitability of conflict. The inevitability of conflict. One of the things, and I say this often, that I love most about the Bible is that it does not hide the flaws of its heroes. It's all right there for you to read. Noah drank too much wine. Moses had a temper. David had a problem with women. Peter denied he even knew Jesus, his Lord and his master. It's all right there for us. It doesn't hide the flaws of its heroes. And here we have two great men of faith, Two of the men most responsible for us being here worshiping Jesus today. And they have a disagreement so significant that the partnership is dissolved. Now, Luke could have left this out as he recorded the book of Acts. He could have just glossed over it and said, well, they had a change in plans or, or God led them in two different directions. But instead, he says it like it is. He says they had a sharp disagreement. So there must be something in this conflict that is important for us so many centuries later to learn. Now, we've already seen plenty of conflict in the book of Acts. Most of the conflict has been between groups of people at odds over doctrinal issues or cultural differences. Remember the dispute uh, about, about the distribution of food to widows in the very early days of the church. The Christians of Greek background felt their widows were being neglected by the Christians of Jewish background. Uh, by, and they resolved to solve that by forming a brand new ministry team led by a man named Stephen. Then there was the conflict with the group called the Judaizers, those who believed the Gentile converts needed to observe all the Jewish traditions, including circumcision, in order to be welcomed into the Christian church. But this is the first time that we're seeing a significant conflict between two individuals who are both followers of Jesus. And it's a very simple conflict. Paul and Barnabas are getting ready to revisit the cities and churches from their first missionary journey. Barnabas wants to bring young John Mark along again. Paul does not. And there it is. John Mark had bailed out on the first journey for whatever reasons, and Barnabas wants to give him a second chance. Paul, on the other hand, doesn't want to make the same mistake twice. He doesn't want to spend any energy on worrying about whether John Mark will make it this time, whether he'll stick it out or not. 
So Paul and Barnabas have a sharp disagreement, a fierce conversation. We all know that conflict is inevitable in human relationships. We have conflict in marriage. I was traveling this past week to a conference uh, in Florida, and as I sat in an airport terminal on, on my way home, I couldn't help but overhear a couple just a few seats away from me in the terminal arguing. They looked to be in their early 60s or so, and they were arguing over tuna, of all things. The wife wanted a tuna fish sandwich for lunch, and the husband was saying back to her, we're in an airport. How am I going to find a tuna fish sandwich in an airport? I'm not going to find tuna in an airport. And they were going back and forth about tuna. Uh, I wanted to jump in and say, uh, excuse me, sir, but I was in a kiosk right over there, and there's a whole stack of tuna fish sandwiches over there, but I, I decided to keep that to myself. At that same conference, I heard uh, a Christian speaker and comedian named Ken Davis, and he said that if you're married and do not have conflict from time to time, you're either married to a carrot or one of you is dead, he said. And I think that's true. Conflict happens. Conflict happens between husband and wife, between parents and children. For some of you, that conflict might have happened on the way to church today. It happens between siblings, between friends. Conflict happens in the workplace, and conflict even happens in ministry, in churches. There's an old preacher's joke that goes like this. A man is rescued after many years being stuck on a deserted island. As he stands on the deck of the ship that rescued him, the captain is looking back at the island and says, I thought you were alone on that island. How come I can see three huts on the beach? Well, the castaway says, uh, that one there was my house, and that one over there was my church. And the skipper says, well, what about the third hut? And the guy says, oh, that's the church I used to go to. See, there are hundreds, if not uh, uh, scores, if not hundreds, of Baptist denominations in America. Not churches, mind you, but hundreds of denominations in America that call themselves Baptist, including... The Southern Baptist, the largest Baptist denomination in America. Uh, there is Converge Worldwide, which is the former Baptist General Conference, which is the denomination that we, FBCG, are associated with. There are the Free Will Baptists, the Regular Baptists, the Old Regular Baptists, the Primitive Baptists, the General Six Principle Baptists, the Reformed Baptists, the Progressive Baptists, the Separate Baptists, the Two Seed in the Spirit Predestinarian Baptists, I'm, I didn't make that up, that's really a name, the Independent Baptist Church of America, and the United Baptists, which is kind of an oxymoron if you're paying attention. Why all these denominations? Well, most of these denominations were birthed out of a conflict over a sharp disagreement. Which translation of the Bible to read in services, how to practice baptism, how to observe communion, a zillion tiny doctrinal distinctives. And since all Baptist churches are, by definition, independent, when a conflict comes up, many times they just form a brand new denomination. That's the church I used to go to. So here we have a conflict between two wise and godly men. Some read this and imagine the conflict to be something like um, a modern-day baseball argument. You know, Paul and Barnabas standing toe-to-toe -to -toe and yelling at each other like a manager and an umpire. I can't believe you want to take him again. Well, if you were a nicer guy, uh, he, he wouldn't have left in the per first place. Well, if you were a little smarter, we wouldn't have taken him in the first place. They imagine it like that. But I think if we look closer at the two men involved here, Paul and Barnabas, and what the eventual outcome is, I think we see something just a little bit different. First, I think we see this wasn't a disagreement anchored in pride or personal agendas or power. As so many of our disagreements uh, escalate uh, because we can't let go of our own pride or agenda. We say, that's my idea. If we don't do my idea, it's going to make me look weak or powerless or foolish. And so the conflict escalates. There's no evidence that either one of these men is clinging to their own position or power. Paul doesn't say, well, Jesus spoke to me in light from heaven, as you recall. Barnabas doesn't say, well, remember, without me, you wouldn't even be here. Rather, it seems that the disagreement was rooted in each man's unique giftedness and in their unique vision for ministry. Let me try to explain. 
Paul was committed to taking the gospel to the Gentile world at all cost, even at the cost of his own life. He's the one who later would write, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul was absolutely prepared to suffer for the name of Jesus. And he knew that anyone who traveled with him would likely face the same kind of suffering. So he was loath to take a young man who was uncertain of his own calling or uncertain of the mission or unprepared to sacrifice his own life for the sake of the gospel. Paul didn't want to do it. Barnabas, on the other hand, was called the son of encouragement. He was committed to nurturing and encouraging others in their own growth. It was his unique spiritual gifting to come alongside, to build up, to enable others. Paul didn't believe John Mark was ready for the kind of ministry he believed God had called him to do. Paul couldn't afford to spend any time or energy worrying about how John Mark was going to do. He had to be on to the next town, on to the next person whose soul needed to be saved. Barnabas believed that John Mark's development was worth investing in, even at the cost of proceeding more slowly with the gospel. Now, if you've ever been on or tried to lead a short-term mission trip, you can understand something about both of these perspectives. Uh, years ago, I led a trip to the Dominican Republic with high school students. We were supposed to be helping build an orphanage for children. But after the very first full day of the trip, at least half of that team became violently ill. I mean, just throwing up all over the place. Sorry to say that out loud, but that was what was happening. We got very little done for a couple of days other than care for six students. But the hidden blessing in that trip was being able to receive the care of the people we actually went to help. So I don't think this disagreement was personal in the sense of ending a friendship or that it even de degenerated ever into bitterness or anger. It was a disagreement about strategy, about tactics, and about priorities and ministry, but it was definitely a disagreement and it was a conflict. The second part of the story is about resolving the conflict, resolving that conflict. Now, I've been part of the leadership team here at FBCG for 28 years, give or take. And throughout those years, we've had our share of fierce conversations at the leadership level about goals, priorities, budgets, all kinds of stuff. But we've had relatively few serious conflicts. But one of the more difficult leadership struggles we went through over those years had to do with the purchase of our West Campus property way back in the late 1990s. At the time, we only had the East Campus, and we were bursting at the seams. And after exhausting all the options on that property, uh, we decided we had to look for another location. And to make a very long story short, a piece of property was located on Randall Road in St. Charles, a few miles to the north. The site was available for a really good price, but we were divided as leaders over the location. Some thought it was too far from the East Campus. Some thought it was too close to other large churches in that area. Some pointed out if we moved to St. Charles, we'd have to change our name. But others didn't have a problem with the location and thought the good price should be the deciding factor. And we did not have consensus among ourselves as leaders. However, we took the proposal to the congregation for a vote anyway. And we did not receive enough votes to approve the purchase of the property. So the leadership was split. The congregation did not get fully on board, which, looking back, was very understandable. We had a leadership crisis on our hands. Looking back from perspective of where we are now, I believe that it was quite possible that many other churches may have suffered a severe split over that issue, because each group could have blamed the other for the failure of the vote. We were overcrowded, we had divided leadership, and we had no property onto which to grow. But here's what happened. We hashed it out together. We agreed to disagree about that particular piece of property, and we determined to never take something to our congregation for a vote without a strong consensus in our leadership. And we began to pray that God would lead us to the right property in the right time. Now, I believe our leadership grew through that conflict, through the way we managed that conflict, and I believe the end result for our church 
was far better. Now, a couple things to notice here. The conflict never gets personal. And this is so hard for us to do. We get enmeshed in our own ideas, our agendas, our vision. And when someone doesn't agree, we can sometimes make it personal. We have no evidence that Paul ever said to Barnabas, well, you're, if, you, if you just weren't such a bleeding heart, Barnabas. Barnabas never looked at Paul and said, well, if you just weren't so type A. They didn't ever make it personal. They don't involve others in the conflict. Neither Paul nor Barnabas goes out and recruits a bunch of people to come back his position against the other. In fact, they never have a bad word to say about the other. And the rest of the story of the book of Acts. They don't try to use Scripture against each other. They don't turn it into a holy war. Well, God said this. No, God said that. Notice they don't compete for the same ministry either. They don't both go to the same town and start separate churches. This is the first church of Paul. No, this is Barnabas Community Chapel. Rather, they go separate directions to multiply gospel impact. See, they both understood this was not a theological issue. It wasn't an issue that threatened the survival of the gospel. It was a personal leadership preference issue. And they handled it as such. I think they both wanted what was best for John Mark. They just had different ideas about how to accomplish that purpose. On his side, Paul believed John Mark wasn't ready for this kind of ministry. He needed time to grow and mature. Barnabas thought the way for John Mark to grow was to get right back on that horse of ministry, the same horse he had fallen off of just a few years before. And I believe John Mark benefited from both of these men's perspectives. Now, if you've ever been responsible for managing a group of people or leading people, or even if you've been a parent, you know there are at least two sides to the whole mentoring process. There is encouragement Positive reinforcement, great job, way to go, you're doing great. And then on the other side, there is accountability or consequences for poor performance. You know, you got to step it up here. You can't keep doing it that way. I need you to step up. Now, some employees or children need more of one than the other, but all need a little bit of both. Paul and Barnabas resolved this conflict by recognizing and respecting each other's perspective and gifts. And then, finally, we see how God redeems the conflict. Back to the property conflict for just a moment. We got back on the same page as leadership. We went back to work defining our mission and vision, and eventually we discovered the property that became our West Campus. And it ended up being a great blessing to have the two campuses so close together for lots of reasons. And we learned some very valuable lessons about the leadership community in the process. And I believe that God redeemed that conflict in ways that still bless this church family today more than 15 years later. Let's see how God, what God does with this conflict between John, Mark, Paul, and Barnabas. Paul needs a new partner now for his ministry. So he chooses a man named Silas, who happens also to be a Roman citizen like Paul. And this becomes very important later on in the story when Paul is arrested. And we'll get there in a few weeks. Paul and Silas go on to revisit a few of the churches from the first journey, but then they're set free to push into unreached territories because Barnabas and John Mark are going to visit yet other churches. Paul and Silas eventually get as far as the great city of Athens in Greece, hundreds of miles away. Paul eventually takes on a young man named Timothy in a mentoring relationship. His letters to Timothy are part of our New Testament. It's interesting to me that later in his life, Paul seems to have softened a bit in his dealings with younger leaders. Many scholars believe Paul met Luke, the physician, on this second missionary journey, and that Luke is the one who eventually wrote the book of Acts and the gospel that bears his own name, Gospel of Luke. Is it possible that none of those incredibly important partnerships would have happened at all if Paul and Barnabas had stayed together. So God redeems this conflict by multiplying ministry. He redeems the conflict by enabling Barnabas and Mark to encourage young churches and believers. He enables Paul and Silas to take the gospel deeper into the Gentile world. 
He, God uses each uniquely gifted leader in his unique way for the purpose of the gospel. Paul grows in his ministry. Barnabas grows in his ministry. John Mark grows. In fact, later in his life, the Apostle Paul actually sends for Mark to come join him as an aide in his own ministry. Silas, Timothy, and Luke are brought into significant positions, and it all happens through an initial sharp disagreement. How do we wrap it up? What's our takeaway? Conflict is inevitable in relationships, even between followers of Jesus. One of my favorite writers said it this way, human flesh is all God has to make saints out of. People aren't perfect. Churches aren't perfect. In a church the size of FECG, we have all kinds of clashing preferences and opinions and music styles, worship venues and preaching styles, the brand of coffee we serve. And sometimes we have fierce conversations. One of the strengths of FBCG over the years is that we've been able to debate issues, to disagree, to resolve conflict in a manner that preserves our most important shared values. We've learned that none of our personal preferences or opinions are more important than honoring Christ with worship. None of them are more important than the truth of the gospel that the world needs. None of them more important than the mission of the church to reach, connect, equip, and serve. So here's our takeaway. Conflict happens in relationships. Conflict can be resolved in those relationships. Conflict can even bring great blessing when we focus not on ourselves, not on our own pride, our own preferences, but when we focus on Christ, His purpose for our lives, His purpose for our marriages, His purpose for our families, and His purpose for His church. Will you bow with me as I close? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the honesty of Luke as he writes the book of Acts. We thank you for this story that happens between Paul and Barnabas, two great men of God. Because we do also experience conflict. In all of our relationships, teach us to resolve these conflicts by honoring you by protecting and preserving your gospel. And teach us to preserve and protect the unity of this, your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.